Hey everyone, I'm Robert Talese. Um, this is my colleague, Scott Aiken. We together uh, do these series of videos called Philosophy 15. These are uh, 15 minutes and no longer uh, unscripted philosophical discussions. Uh, Scott and I are the authors of this book, uh, Why We Argue and How We Should, A Guide to Political Disagreement. And uh, we wanted to talk today about a puzzle that Scott's found uh, in a fragment uh, from Xenophanes about horses and their gods. Horses and their gods, and their drawings of their gods. So this is... Depictions of gods. Depictions of gods. So this is from fragment 15. Uh, if horses or oxen or lions, oh my, had hands, or could draw with their hands and accomplish such works as men, horses would draw the figures of the gods as similar to horses, and the oxen as similar to oxen and they would make the bodies of the sort which each of them had. So, the question is, so what if horses would draw their gods like horses? <laughs> right? What, what does that mean? What comes of the fact that if horses had gods, they draw them like horses? Um, it looks like on the face of it, Xenophanes is making a kind of observation, and then the observation is supposed to come home. Right? Uh, the observation is that every kind of type of thing if it has a god makes the type of thing makes the god that it's got that it's got look like the type of thing that it is so horses have horse gods lions have lion gods oxen have oxen gods then you could just probably produce more sparrows have sparrow gods earthworms have earthworm gods and humans have human looking gods um there's a kind of a puzzle that arises from that and said man the place just olympus just got populated <laughs> <laughs> Not enough real estate up there for all the gods now. Maybe, well, maybe the, uh, maybe the sparrows will live in certain kinds of the places. The air above. The air above Olympus, yeah. right? That might make Zeus unhappy. But, right. Um, so what follows if all these creatures would make their gods uh, as, as such? Uh, it seems like a strange observation. It looks like it's pregnant with something. Um, so what does Xenophides think? What does he, what do we... What does he suggest follows? Well, what he suggests follows is that we shouldn't think that the god has a body at all. Yeah. Um, so part of the challenge is to sort of figure out what the critical edge of this, of this fragment is. The critical edge of the fragment seems to just be that you kind of make the gods, that it's a criticism, a kind of an epistemic criticism of folks making the gods look like them. Um, and one of the upshots is that he thinks that if you depict gods as having bodies like yours, and maybe just bodies overall, and he thinks that you shouldn't depict them as moving. We human beings have a habit of depicting the gods not only as having human bodies, but having human vices. They lie to each other, they cheat each other, they, have tem they get tempted by things. Um, that he thinks that that's impious too. He thinks that there's no reason to think that the gods are like that. He thinks the god, as a consequence, should be one. There should only be one god. He should be perfect. He should be omnipotent. He should be omniscient. Uh, he should be a sort of above the fray and uh, never doing anything that's improper. And there's a kind of a puzzle as to whether or not he thinks that you should even think that the god has a body at all. So once you start stripping away all the, the, all the contingent things about you that you then start attributing to the God, it looks like we've kind of got a model for a negative theology, but what comes out on the other side is more this sort of positive, almost Anselmian st style, right? It's like, you, know, you only, pre you, the, the, what we seem to be attributing to the God are just contingent things that could be better or could be worse, but you're only supposed to project the best things on God. Yeah, I'm puzzled by the. I, I guess I'm puzzled by the whole thing. I'm like, so, it seems that um, uh, anthropomorphic models of God um, are clearly flawed. Yes. Okay. So, if that's what the Xenophanes fragment is supposed to be showing us, that yeah. is that our depictions or our models of the ways in which we conceptualize God are always going to be um, uh, uh, a, you know, sort of infused with a kind of self-flattery or right. some uh, some implausible um, uh, uh, attribution of qualities that are uh, like us to God. Um, that seems right, because after all, I mean, 
um, the gods that people today say they believe in um, shouldn't have bodies because they don't have physical location, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, that seems right. So uh, they can't be physically located. They don't have senses, so they don't have things. They, they don't. They don't see things yeah. in any way that we would understand seeing, yeah. right? Um, they don't have a, a you know, God doesn't have a left hand and a right hand, right? I mean, can't, right? Uh, you need... Hands, first off, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, right, I mean, we, we, in some ways, start with the anthropomorphic notions, and there seems to be a lot that gets written onto it. I think the Xenophanes fragment just starts with the thought that, like, isn't it silly that horses would do that, right? Thinking that there's something plausible to that thought. And then it sort of comes home to our depictions of gods. Um, and it starts kind of on the one hand where you have like the sort of the laughable uh, depictions of, uh, of people making the gods look a whole lot like them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So, uh, so the Greeks, of course, uh, kept getting surprised by the fact that they'd show up in places and the people would make the gods that whenever they depict them look like them. Um, and that happens, you know, that happens even now, right? It's like you have all the, the, the fights about, like, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus <laughs> phenomenon. That's, that seems wildly implausible. Um, so, yeah. uh, so all these sorts of cases are ones where, right, as you'd said, a kind of a, you might call it theological narcissism, right? You take yourself and you sort of project it up and make it, make that the divine. Um, the question, though, is that's, so far, that's just a sort of a purely critical program. Right? That's criticizing people's conceptions of the divine, saying, well, you're just projecting yourself up there. The question that always arises with, this, with these sort of critical programs is that if you're such a skeptic along these lines, how do you get a positive theology on the other side? Right? Right. So um, how, do you, like, how do you on the other side get to say things like, well, as Xenophanes does, God's one, God's really great, he's really knowing, he's morally perfect, and things like that. Is that yet another projection in this case of just a sort of a really uptight rationalist, <laughs> right? Is, is Anselm's God, right, who's supposed to be stripped of all these contingencies, nevertheless the projection of a certain kind of character type? Um, and so there's a funny kind of slingshot element, you might call it, or boomerang element that comes back with, uh, with, this, with this kind of debunking strategy that you've got with positive conceptions of God. Once you take this debunking strategy on, it's really hard on the other side. It's good critical theology, but it looks like on the other side, doing positive theology is going to be a real uphill battle. Why? Because all the ways in which you're then going to start putting positive properties on God on the other side, it looks like is going to be subject to the same kinds of critical worries that you had with the critical theology in the first place. Right, and it would be hard to bite the bullet on that and just say no depiction of God, not even depictions in this right. very sort of um, far-flung sense that yeah. you can't attribute properties Full like stop. goodness or whatever in any yeah. straightforward way. Because I take it that anybody who's interested in doing this kind of theology is also interested in winding up with something at the end of the process that it would still make sense to say it's possible to worship. That's right. It's so, like, right. like if it's just a big old black hole. Yeah, I've got a, I got a, I got a theological reform program that makes it so that religion's unpractical now. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. That, that there couldn't be any content Praying to uh, can't pray to be, it yeah, anymore. The, like the, it, presumably that means that it understands human language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's another projection. Or it, isn't can, it? it can hear your prayer. Right. Hear. What? Right. So I, yeah. So it looks then it's got to be a mystical, a weird. It's, I mean, so yeah. So that's one of the puzzles with on the one hand a lot of these kinds of with certainly with Xenophanes, that he's got this really high grade uh, critical program with regards to to, to, to to theology. But then on the other hand, he has this very high grade uh, positive theological program that comes out the other side. It's like, how in the world do those two things fit yeah. together? It's like, you're such a skeptic with whenever everybody else is talking about God. But then when you talk, you're like, well, this looks like it's about right. You know? <laughs> Um, and by the way, this seems to be a metaphilosophical lesson generally, using, using high-grade skeptical tropes against one's opponents, clearing the decks, we've called it in the past, called clearing the decks fallacy, using high, and then whenever it's your turn to talk, getting considerably lower <laughs> epistemic standards for you to start saying stuff. How convenient. Um, yeah, that's not bad. Well, it's the order that you do it that yeah. lets you... <laughs> 
um, but you know, I think that I think that there's still a case for Xenophanes' uh, positive program on the other side. But that's you know that requires a particular reading of his epistemology and and so on. But and does the same do you get the same kind of set of concerns if you just say, as I take it, uh, some religious believers today would say? Well, when we talk about you know being on you know God's right hand and God hearing your prayers and God seeing what you're doing, these are metaphors. Right. Does yeah. that help? I presume so. I mean, uh, I I guess my thought is uh, they're certainly consistent with, but certainly the implicature is wrong with regards to the thought that God is omniscient. Right. It's like well. Of course he hears your prayers. He also hears your deep, dark secrets. <laughs> he also hears your doubts, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so there's one way to save it, which is, again, to, to make it consistent with these sort of more uh, God of the philosophers kinds of models. But it makes it, you know, it makes it so that a lot of those sorts of things become, you know, uh, uh, just mere truisms. So let me ask one question. So I get, I maybe... Uh Maybe I haven't thought hard enough about what metaphors are, how metaphors work. Hmm. Um, in order for a metaphor to be successful, don't you have to know the two things that the metaphor is... Don't you have to have independent knowledge of the two items, the, the thing that's... So right. you say, like, okay, well, when we talk about God's hands, that's or God's ears or God's eyes, that's a metaphorical way of talking about... But don't you have to Something have a non-metaphorical thing on the other end? Robust to make as a metaphor yeah. would be appropriate to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it looks like there's... Again, I think that there's, uh, there's a way of completely making it vacuous, which is, again, to say that he's omniscient, and so as a consequence has access to all these sorts of things. And so whatever factivity that you've got from seeing and hearing is just the factivity of omniscience. You can imagine someone saying that, right? So he sees every sparrow when it falls is just a way of saying he's omniscient, right? Um, but uh, the any of the ways in which you would then say things like he hears your prayers, that sounds like he's got particular focus on, right? Uh, that maybe has got a kind of a model of consciousness that that again requires a kind of a projection. Yeah. Um, right. That your prayers come out of the background of all the other noise or all the other stuff that he presumably is seeing and hearing and tasting. But by the way, we never say that God tastes. God, God tastes. Does God smell? <laughs> Does uh, he smell? Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe. And Zeus smell. sometimes smells. Zeus, Zeus smells the, the, the smell of the burning fat on the hecatombs. Um, and isn't... Um, the devil has a smell, right? I mean, so, oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. He himself, right, yeah, yeah. he doesn't smell with his nose, he yeah. smells with something, <laughs> right, something else on him smells. Yeah, he yeah. has a, he has a scent. Right. Um, uh, well, huh. Uh, is there a problem about omniscience? I mean, can an omniscient being know what it's like to learn something? Right, so you, right, it seems like you've got a, a kind of puzzle of, right, all the sort of the omni attributes have clearly got uh, paradoxes with regards to them. That, by the way, is, so one of the reasons why Xenophany in theology works the way that it does is that it kind of works again on a kind of quasi Anselmian thought that you attribute to God the best stuff. So as a consequence, you get to the omnis. And so as a consequence, you can't have two of them. Why? Because you can't have a, one God more omni than another, right? right. So there's only got to be one. So that all works out. But then if you keep going, it looks like you get a lot fewer than 12 gods, right? <laughs> maybe not just one, right? Uh, once you run these sort of the paradoxes of Omni, maybe there might not be any. Well. Thanks, folks. Philosophy 15, and we'll see you next time.